So this talk is about, um, I think there's a couple of AI talks in this room. So, you know, um, from, from this and the following two are both AI talks. And uh, we're gonna have some exciting stuff to show. And uh, uh, um, so it'll be AI, getting started with AI and WebAssembly. So uh, my name is Michael Yuan, and I am um, the founder of the Wasm Edge project. And, uh, yep, so I'm Angel, I'm a staff engineer in the Wasm team inside the VMware AI Labs. Thank you. All right, so I think we should um, uh, start with a demo, you know, so that, you know, just, uh, and then we get into why we do this and how we do this and all that. So um, this is a demo I showed earlier today at uh, the, um, the Rust Global Conference. It is, uh, oh, this, what you see is what you get. This is all there is to the code, you know, to do object detection in using Rust and running in Wasm, okay? So um, people keep saying that Python is simple, Rust is difficult, but look at this. It's in fairly big fonts. I can fit everything into a single screen. And uh, what it does, it's also, it's easy to read. It's a main function and it takes a, a file name called the model pass and then the other file is called image pass. It takes a model and image. And then it uses a builder pattern to build up the model and then run the model and then get a result to say, you know, detect what's on the model, uh, what's on the image and then draw boxes on the image. So let's see the image that we gave it, right? You know, so if we give it like image like this, there's a cat and a dog. And uh, if we just compile this using cargo build, you know, compile this into WebAssembly and run it in Wasm Edge. So here is what, um, how you run the Wasm application in Wasm Edge, right? You know, so um, you use the Wasm Edge command line, you can use it in, in many different places, you know, embedded in, uh, in other SDK. So you run the Wasm application and then give it an image called example.jpg, which is that um, uh, cat and dog picture, and have an output image, which is well, what we're gonna generate from the, uh, from the application. So the application, if you, if you remember, it has a draw, draw boxes, right? So once you run this, it runs the, it runs the model and then gives the result. It's, uh, um, the result shows there's two boxes, and uh, we draw the boxes on the, on the original image and output to it, right? You know, so this is um, how easy it is to use Wasm to do uh, AI inference. There's uh, several things that I think are really important. The first thing is that um, this has zero Python dependency. There's no need to install Python and figure out how it works. And then wrap a container around Python, which um, from, the, from the cases I see could easily be one gigabytes. Um, the whole awesome application here is like two megabytes or one megabyte, something like that. And it's completely portable across all the CPU architectures and all the GPU architectures because the portability of Wasm, you know, that's, and it's managed, uh, can be easily managed by container tools like Docker or Podme or Kubernetes, right? So, you know, that's, um, that's the power of, you know, um, to do AI inference in Wasm. Uh, you know, um, from our point of view, it's really to uh, Wasm as a, as a, um, as a language glue that's, that ties together all those uh, underlying, um, you know, um, uh, AI frameworks and inference frameworks. So if you're interested in the demos, there's a link here that you can, um, you can run it yourself. So um, then in the next session, I'll pass to Andrew to talk about machine learning. So thank you. Um... So yeah, before jumping a little bit into the specifics of AI and WebAssembly, let's do a quick introduction about machine learning. Just in case you are not really familiar with, the, with this matter, I think it's interesting that you get a taste about how it works. So if we think about machine learning, sometimes it looks like magic. You get basically something and you get an output. But in reality, if you uncover this, everything is mathematics. So that's everything that runs under the machine learning and AI ecosystem. If we follow this model, what we basically have is input, which are data that we give to the machine learning models, which could be many different sources, like audio, a video, an image, metrics, text, whatever you want. Then it moves inside the neural network, which is the actual model that runs all the inference, and it gives you an output, which are predictions. And basically, it depends on the model that you're running. This output may be the next token or the next text in large language models. It could be 
an image classification as Michael was showing me before, like what are the different boxes, the different probabilities and the locations. If we try to uncover a little bit more that neural network uh, block, it's basically a graph of interconnected nodes. So it takes the inputs, it performs several mathematical um, operations to the different data, and it moves all the information, performs, and then goes into the output layer in which it decides what's the, what's the value that it's going to provide or what are the things that it predicts. If we go into the example of the doc of the image classification, we are going to simplify that a little bit more. So here we have a, suppose we have a model that actually classifies an image as a dog or as a cat. So you have this input, but in reality, what it happens is that you split that input in data that the model understands. And this kind of models usually work with the three different channels. So first you get the image in the different channels, you get the pixels, you are watching here the, the image, but the model, what it understands, are the pixels. Then you get, this is what it's called the input layer. Then we have the intermediate layers, which are the ones that actually performs all the computation. It gets all the numbers about the image that you already provided. And then you get the output, which in this case is basically two different values. So you get if it's a cat, with what probability, and if it's a dog, which is the probability. This is how it works in reality under the hood. But there is a still a missing piece. So we have this example model which takes the dog and then it gives you this information like it's a dog with high probability and it's not a cat. But how it actually knows what's a dog or what's a cat? The thing is that anytime you have a machine learning model, it doesn't know at the beginning what are the values inside those mathematical operations. It, you need to train first. So you give them a set of information to identify, hey, this is an image, and this image is a dog, this is an image, and this image is a cat. So after looping into this specific training set, it detects what are the best numbers to put on those nodes to get this information. So after you train the model, you can take it, and then you can start using it to predict the, the image that you are going to pass to it. So now that we have those base concepts about um, AI, let's continue with AI and WebAssembly with Michael. All right, thank you, Angel. So in the first example that I showed is to run the inference. And uh, as Angel has mentioned, once you have the data and model trained, you can run inference easily in WebAssembly. But how exactly do you do it? So there are several ways that you can run inference. So, as we, um, you know, um, a lot of people consider WASM as a, uh, as a CPU architecture. So, you know, it's, uh, the compiler certainly sees that. You can compare it to x86 or ARM or WASM, right? You know, so if you compare it to WASM, it's, uh, it's generated code that can run inside the WASM runtime. However, it can also interact with other s uh, systems on, um, uh, on the host computer including the machine learning framework that potentially runs on the GPU, right? So it could possibly have uh, interact with the machine learning backend and talk to the CPU and the GPU that's running on the same host machine. So, you know, not only CPU, GPU, but also TPUs, there's, um, you know, uh, Apple Silicon, they have their own, uh, their own set of, you know, um, um, uh, neural chips. And uh, uh, you, you also have, um, uh, I think ARM also have their, um, you know, I forgot what's the name. What, what it's called, but their own set of standard for, for, for neural networking inference, right? So you can have, because the WASM application lives here, um, the actual um, inference application lives here. There, it was separated by an interface called the WASM. And the WASM is a WASM standard. It allows the WASM application to be able to adapt to different backends. So that, that's where I said it's portable. So you know the WASM application can uh, you compile it once, run it everywhere. It doesn't need to change at all. It's, uh, but whether it runs on CPU or on the GPU or Apple Silicon or anything, it depends on the host. Where did you install the WASM runtime? Because when you install the WASM runtime, it figures out what hardware do you have on your system. And then through the WASM interface, it, it, it allows the WASM application to be able to use all those, um, all those uh, underlying uh, hardware features. 
So the WASI N standard, you know, it's a uh, um, it's WASI neural network, right? You know, it's meaning it's exposing the the underlying uh, AI and the machine learning framework as a host function into the WASM uh, into the WASM runtime, and it started in 2019, right before the pandemic, and uh, um, so this um, you know I in this conference it's the first time I met the authors of WASI and uh, protocol face to face. <laughs> you know that's uh, you know we. Um, we talked many times. We implemented this standard, but we never met face to face. And uh, so um, it enables user host function, meaning that's so the way um, the benefit of using the host function is that it uh, provides full performance of the underlying hardware. So you can use any GPU or any um, um, you know accelerators that's available on the host. It's uh, um, uh, as a standard. It's currently in phase two. Meaning that it's being implemented. There's uh, there are new things that's currently still being added to it. And it's currently being implemented by the three um, WASM runtimes, the WASM time, WAMR, and WASM Edge. Uh, WASM is supporting WASM Edge. So, uh, first of all, because of the standard, so we are fully uh, standard compliant. Uh, we contributed to the current Rust uh, API quake, you know, meaning that's uh, um, because there's a host function that's, uh, that runs the workload, but inside the WASM, you still need an uh, API where you know, your application is written in Rust or written in other languages, and you compile into the WASI uh, standard to run inside the WASM, right? So, you know, uh, we, we, we contributed the API create. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things about um, WASI and supporting WASM uh, Edge is that we support multiple backends. We support TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, um, PyTorch, OpenYNO, and uh, GGML. I, I'm gonna talk about GGML in a minute. So essentially, all the leading machine learning frameworks, that's, um, they are all supported um, inside WASM Edge. So, you know, so if you write an application that's, say, using a PyTorch model or using a TensorFlow model, you can compile to WASM Edge, and then you will know that if the underlying framework is in, dependency is installed and it's available on the host, it's going to run. Right? Um, the other interesting thing about it is that um, a WASM Edge has a plug-in mechanism that is uh, a fully component model ready, meaning that's, uh, you, we've heard about component model today, right? You know, there's a width interface, you know, that's, um, they call, uh, I forgot the word, is that the universal SDK or the, um, you know, codeless SDK, right? So the, the plugins provide the interface between the, uh, the WASM runtime and the PyTorch and TensorFlow. But um, the, the, um, the interface between it and also the, the, the API inside the WASM can be generated by component tools, right? And uh, then, um, like everything in WASM, that's, um, you know, we started in Rust, but uh, other languages are still uh, also being supported, like JavaScript and the Python APIs this is one of our collaboration with VMware to, uh, to enable Python APIs for, for, um, for WASM. And uh, so, the current, um, the current support, um, in, um, I can only speak for the uh, WASM Edge ecosystem, is that we have those backends, and uh, um, those backends are all tensor frameworks. And we have data processing frameworks to support. So for instance, you know, um, in the image processing scenario, um, to resize the image or to make the image, um, um, you know, to convert the image into tensor, there's lots, lots of things you need to do with the image. And you could do that, uh, within the was uh, within Wasm, or you can use other host functions to facilitate that. So, for instance, we we uh, we are porting the the, the uh, we are halfway through porting the two libraries, the OpenCV and the FFmpeg, into become Wasm compatible, so that in the, in the Rust or JavaScript application, you will be able to call those functions to pre-process the the uh, the image data and turn them into tensor, and uh, and to combine those together, you know we have um, um, we have now supported several. Um, uh, I would say popular model libraries. You know, one is MediaPipe. You know, that's um, it's a um, Google has a large set of um, AI models that they offer as part of the GCP service, which does you know image recognition, gesture recognition, natural language uh, sentiment analysis, and you know things like that. And uh, Yolo Five is a very um, is a very advanced and dedicated image image processing framework. Where you know we use OpenCV on the front end, and we uh, we uh, we get the data, you know, we get the uh, image data out of that, and then we process that with YOLO, and then we come back to use OpenCV again to draw the boxes and the, on the video and on the image, and you know things like that. So both of those are mostly 
uh, image processing. And uh, uh, the other thing, which um, is the demo we're going to show at the very end, is that we, for, uh, we are now supporting the, um, the, the, the large language model as well, the Llama model from, from Meta. We go all the way up to the uh, largest model, you know, so there are, um, you know, um, uh, 70 billion parameter model that can, can now fully run inside WaterMatch, you know, by um, using the architecture we have just described. So the way to do it is to use um, this model framework. So the, the Llama model was originally published in Python, but there's a highly optimized format called GGML, and uh, we convert the model to that, to that format and then run it. In the end, I will uh, give a demo. But, um, yes, so. Okay, so we saw like um, how you can run inference using the host as Michael explained, there are many different options, many different backends you can use. But in WebAssembly, you have also a different option or a second option that you can take, and it's basically render time inference inside the mobile. It means that you are not using anything from the host, you are running everything on the CPU. Of course, the performance may vary depending on the model. You cannot run like large language models because of the limitations of the, of the WebAssembly standard. But for certain use cases, you can get a pretty decent uh, performance um, and usability. So one of the things that I really like about this approach is that you get what I say maximum portability, which is basically any place in which you have a WebAssembly runtime can run this specific inference, uh, this specific model for inference. So the main requirement, if you want to follow this specific approach, is that you need to compile a machine learning engine into the WebAssembly model. So you can, you can run it from inside directly. You don't need to rely on anything on the host to run, for example, PyTorch or, or GGML. Everything must be done inside the WebAssembly model. One of the examples that I found, I was pretty excited. I actually saw this example uh, in a community meeting from Wasanech. It's about the Lama 2C project. So Lama 2C project is a, is a project created by Andre Karpathy, which is now uh, on OpenAI, but before he was the head of Tesla, the, uh, the autopilot. So he created a project that runs, that it's basically an inference engine for Lama 2 uh, models, but it's written in, in a single C file of 600 lines. So just for learning purposes, this is amazing because you can see the entire architecture, you can really follow all the different steps that you need to, the, to, do, um, to do to do inference with this specific uh, model. The thing is that after a few weeks, this, this project was ported to many different languages. You can see SIG support, you can see Rust, Python, JavaScript, all the languages, all people started to port this just to demonstrate how you can run it in many different environments. And the good thing is that Andrek also created or, um, yeah, or trained one model, uh, one model that basically is a large language model that runs, um, that can run on CPUs um, in a very efficient way. It's called Tiny Lamas, which is, um, it's just a toy model that creates uh, histories for children. But it's pretty cool to see because he created it from a very big model, which is around 400 megabytes, but then he started to string and created this, uh, smaller versions. And you can have one that I will show you later, which is only one megabyte. And it's actually, it's able to write English that makes sense, which for me, I think it's amazing. And having this, this ability of creating models that are really specialized and at that size opens a new set of possibilities. Just to show you how uh, this is portable, this is my personal laptop. Um, I'm running this with Wasantine just to show that this, this works in any, in any runtime. And here you can see that when mapping the model inside, calling the Lama to see dot Wasan file, that it's just a compiled version of that project into WebAssembly and WASI, you get all this directly. You don't need to do anything more. It just runs properly. I can take the same exact model and put it into a RIS-5 board and it runs exactly the same. So I don't need to do anything. I don't need to recompile. I don't need to install any tool. It just runs and it works as it was doing in my Mac OS. But that's not all. I can take it and put it on the browser. Why not? It's just a WebAssembly and the browser comes with a WebAssembly runtime. So 
this, these are the kind of possibilities that this specific approach of running inference in WebAssembly opens that I didn't see before. And you can access to this URL, inference.wasanlabs.dev, just to see how it works and try it by yourself. And yeah, so now what's, what's next on AI and WebAssembly? Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, that's, um, I thought the demo was very uh, impressive, you know, that's uh, um, because that really shows uh, Wasm's capability to run efficiently on the CPU, right? You can see the text come out, just, just streaming out, right? You know, um, however, um, there's, um, through this approach, there's a problem um, that's, um, that is difficult to solve with Wasm, you know, because the Wasm architecture only allows four gigabytes of memory. And if we do not, if we go beyond the tiny llamas, it would be, you know, uh, I think the smallest llama 2 model has, um, it's seven, mega, uh, seven gigabytes, you know, something like that. Yeah, so, so the file is that, and then you put, import it into the memory, it's gonna be, gonna, gonna be larger. So it typically requires, you know, um, people recommend to at least have, um, you know, um, uh, 64 gigabytes in, on the GPU to run those models. So there are some models that are difficult to run in, uh, um, you, you know, that's uh, especially general purpose, purpose models that's difficult to run um, using, um, you know, reading data into the CPU and run inside WASM approach. So that leads to the next things that we want. Um, we want. So the first is in the WASI NN space, there's now, um, so, by the way, WASI NN is a, is a phase two specification. I would really encourage you guys to, um, you know, Andrew is right there, you know, so he's, uh, he's one of the original authors of WASI NN at Intel. You know, so um, I, I would really encourage you guys to, um, uh, to participate in this work because, you know, um, uh, we are seeing a lot more um, an interest and demand for running inference um, through, through WebAssembly. So WASI NN would be one of, uh, would be a great way to do that. And one of the things that we do now is to name the models. Name, uh, what does name model mean? I'm going to show a demo in a minute. So the name of the model um, bypasses the WASM memory space. So it copies the, the, the model from the disk directly to the inference framework. So the inference framework, be it PyTorch, be it TensorFlow, or be it GGML backend, it copies directly to the inference um, um, uh, application on the host. That um, really increases the efficiency and really that's allows us to run GPU and really get around of the CPU memory or constraints that Wasm may have, right? And then there's, uh, um, there's um, uh, also a lot of ecosystem work that has to be done in the, um, in the space. For instance, you know, uh, just to have inference is not enough because inference, your input is tensor and output is tensor, that's it. You know, tensor is just a big uh, array of numbers, right? How do you get to that tensor is, is, um, is a million dollar question, right? Yeah, I, I have an image or I have a piece of text. How do I turn that into a series of numbers? And then after the inference, come back with a series of numbers. How do I turn that into whether it's a dog or cat? You know, that's, uh, um, or the, the boxes on the, on the images, right? You know, so the pre-processing and the post-processing requires, uh, it's one of the biggest strengths Python has today because it has a lot of libraries to do that. And uh, um, as you can see, we have done a lot of work on the, on, on the on, um, you know, in the Rust ecosystem with Wasm, you know, to, to build those uh, pre-processing and post-processing uh, functions into, uh, into Rust functions or into Rust host functions like OpenCV and FFmpeg. But that requires more work from the, from the community, you know, to, uh, to, to really support more models. Right now we support um, uh, some of the models that we use, our customers use, but, you know, um, I, I think there's a lot more you know, to grow this ecosystem. And uh, um, with that related, there's improving the tool chain. And I also um, um, mentioned early on is that uh, what is the strength of WASM really is, uh, is the multi-language support. So we really want the JavaScript API and Python support. So we, all, uh, we actually, we, um, you know, um, through QuickJS implementation, we now have a, have a version of WASM that hooked into uh, JavaScript. So, in, uh, so when you run JavaScript inside WASM, you can have an inference function that you can, you know, you can use JavaScript to do image processing, and then, you know, um, to do the inference using um, um, using a JavaScript function. But in reality, it calls Wasm and then calls uh, TensorFlow and then get the result back, right? You know, so JavaScript API is done through that, and the Python API we can do the same. So, you know, um, VMware has a, a C Python um, um, a port to Wasm. So, you know, um, so. Um, 
so we have a joint internship program. We have a graduate student working for us. That's uh, um, that is adding those Swazi NN functions into um, the C Python port of um, of uh, the Watson port of C Python, right? <laughs> so, in order to illustrate this name, the model, you know how it handles a very large, um, very large language model. Again, this is the entire application. You know, this is um, I'm not showing you part of the application or showing you, you know, and uh, with all the print statement in there because you know I just got it running like last night, so I got all those debug statements I haven't even removed, right? You know, so it's uh, um, the the point I want to convey is that it's really simple. You know, it's uh, it's um, it's you know. It, People say Python is easy, but look at how easy that, this one is. You know, so it takes a model, then it takes a prompt. The prompt is a is a is a piece of text, right? You know, like uh, like uh, uh, Andrew said, it's once upon a time. You know, some a long time ago, whatever, right? You know, so it asks a question about uh, uh, of the model. So to build the model from the from the um, and the model encoding is now GGML, which we took the Llama two model and converted into GGML, which is still about ten gigabytes big. And uh, we read that model and build that into, um, you, you know, so in, in the, in the Watson memory, now we have a representation of that model. And then we initialize the context and then we create the tensor data from the prompt. So the prompt is, uh, is, uh, is, is an English sentence. And we turn that into bytes and, uh, and, and it, becomes a, it becomes the model input. So the good thing about the GGML is that you don't need to do other pre-processing. You just turn the text into, um, into a byte stream, and that's it. You turn, you send that into the, the, um, into the model, and the the only the, the only thing that does computation is really is the compute, right? So in the context, you do the compute, and then you get a result. You turn the result into, uh, you encode the result into UTF-8 and into a sentence. So let's see um, how it works. So. Um, at the top, you know, it's uh, it's Wasm Edge, and the uh, NN preload is to say I want to use the named function in Wasm NN to preload a file. This file is Llama 2 13 billion parameter, the chat model, and uh, so this whole thing is a file that's in my local file system. It's about, I think, um, 15 gigabytes big, and then. The, the Rust application I just had compiled into this wasm edge dash ggml dash llama dot wasm. This whole application is about two megabytes. And uh, it's entirely portable across all the CPU architecture and all the GPU architecture, depending on what, what GPU did you, um, did you install here. So if you have a GPU here, you just need the command line to change that CPU into GPU. You know, so you would be able to get, to, um, get, uh, get a media CUDA access to it, right? So then the prompt is, who is Robert Oppenheimer, okay? And uh, so it's thinking, and then it generates the output. Um, the output, it's, uh, I'm showing the output here because, you know, um, it's very self-evident. It's generated by the, by a well-trained large language model with a, lot, not, with a lot of knowledge. It knows who he is. It's, uh, it's produced completely correct and natural sounding English language sentences. However, the middle part about his education background is completely made up. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's entirely hallucinating because he graduated from Harvard. He never went to MIT. His PhD advisor is not Ernest Lawrence. It's uh, Max Bowen. He's, uh, he's not from University of California at Berkeley. He's, he's, uh, he went to Cambridge and then went to a German university. So, you know, but it sounds very, you know, reasonable, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, so, you know, just to, to show, you know, that's, um, so people use this type of models, you know, um, use Llama 2 models to, to fine tune it, to add knowledge to it. And, uh, um, you know, that's one of the biggest drivers um, at AI today, right? You know, that's, uh, you know, um, 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 we, we don't necessarily want to use OpenAI's models or, you know, chat GPT, but we want to train our own models so that it would say things, have our domain knowledge. And uh, um, a WASM really provide an efficient way for you to um, for you to provide services to, um, around those models. You can do it with GPU, you can do it with uh, CPU, you can do it with Apple Silicon. You know, Apple has become a sort of a, a really interesting player in this because right now if I buy a, a media a machine that's, uh, that has the, the proper GPU to run this, it costs like $15,000 and uh, a two months waiting list. The Apple Studio, 
also run this, it's six thousand dollars. You know, it's become the cheapest option out there. So you know, so I want to show you. You know, that's how the named model works, and uh, um, you know, um, and and it really can scale all the way up to anything that the hardware can handle. You know, it's a get um, it's a get around Wasm's limit of the um, the pointer size and the memory size and all that. So in that sense, Wasm really become Python. You know, because what Python does is to manage those things and delegate it to the local libraries so that CUDA libraries knows how to run on the GPU, right? Wasm it does the same thing now for us, but in the, in the way that is cross-platform, that is uh, um, um, a cross-platform and cross-language, right? So there are, uh, there are a couple of links, um, you know, that's, um, you, you know, if you're interested in learning more, and uh, um, on top is, uh, um, you know, we have all our AI inference articles and tutorials at the top link. And then uh, the, the, the demo you have just seen, including uh, a, a GitHub action that's use the, use the GitHub CI to do AI, you know, to do the um, a large language model inference is, uh, is in this repository is we call WASI and examples. Um, so, Andrew, do you want to talk about your... Yeah, so one thing that we released uh, last week is that we have one project which is called Wasm Worker Server that allows you to develop and run serverless applications on top of WebAssembly. You can mix and match also different languages. Um, we thought like if you already have that capability about, for example, creating one application using Ruby, Python, and JavaScript at the same time, why not take an advantage of AI and thanks to the Wasm proposal, we integrated AI powered workers, uh, workers in, the, in the platform. So now you have this article that shows you a tutorial about how to run your first AI worker, and you have the documentation with all the information about how to run it. It's just one page, it's not that, that uh, you can download directly the example and run it in case you are curious. Um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, so, what, what Michael was mentioning before, there are many different opportunities to contribute to the to the WASNN and the AI ecosystem. And one of the programs is the Linux uh, Foundation. It's Linux Foundation. Um, yeah, exactly. So there are different uh, open issues that you can contribute if you are interested on the WASN Edge repo and different repositories. One, for example, that we have is about adding support to TensorFlow and PyTorch in the Python version in WASN Edge. So if you want to start contributing to the ecosystem, these are great opportunities, and I encourage you to check it. At least you have also the label, so you can see another uh, different opportunities that you have, and it's a good way to get engaged um, and start working on this. And yeah, I think that's, that's all we have for, for you. Thank you very much for, for being here, attending the, the talk. Um, I don't know if we have time. I think we have one minute for questions, so maybe we can take one question. Okay, so I think for the first question, I mean, the first question is about, um, since we have already this opportunity to run AI inside the WebAssembly module, but how it compares in terms of performance about running it in a bare metal or in a native way. So I think that you may have some something to say here because we didn't do benchmark on Wasm workers yet. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so um, the bulk of the workload is um, done in the AI framework itself, say PyTorch and TensorFlow, right? You know, so um, in that part, it be it's exactly the same because we are uh, using uh, PyTorch or GML, you know, or uh, using those native framework to do the inference. The performance difference comes from the pre-processing and uh, and uh, um, post-processing. Um, by some estimates, 95% uh, of the CPU cycle was spent on pre-processing and post-processing because the 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 five percent inference is mostly done on GPU, right? So. In that regard, Wasm has a huge benefit over, say, Python, because if you have Python to do pre-processing, you know that's uh, 
it is really terribly slow. So, you know, that's why um, Greg Bachman said uh, a very famous quote is to say the modern Python program is to find out where the um, modern machine learning program is to find out where the Python bo bo bottleneck is, right? You know, because you find something slow, it's probably because Python doesn't call a native library for that. Python didn't use OpenCV; it just used uh, try to do this inside of Python. That is ten thousand times slower than say to pass it to a uh, to a native framework. And uh, um, in that regard, Wasm doesn't have this problem because Wasm has, um, uh, you know, near native performance, especially when you do AOT. So you can write those things in Rust and then have it run in, in Wasm, right? You know, so I think in a, in a fully optimized environment where you are just using Python as a, as a dress and have everything passed to C++, you're going to get similar performance between Wasm and Python. But, you know, if you are not careful and one of your pre-processing functions are actually implemented in Python, then you're gonna, uh, then the wasm gonna be a lot faster, you know, so that's, uh, so the second question is uh, how, yeah, how, yeah, yeah, so um, we, we all heard uh, Luke Wagner about, uh, talk about component model today, you know, that was, um, you know, to address this type of issues, you know, so um, uh, we have um, a really high hope that's, uh, you know, the cross-language invocation in Wasm would become, um, you know, um, would become easier in the, in the future, right? Um, um, at this moment, however, I think it, uh, it, it's still mostly Wasm, it's Wasm invoking host functions, not Wasm invoking Wasm, you know? So it's, uh, so you have a Wasm, and then you have some Python, uh, TensorFlow here is easy, uh, PyTorch is here is easy, but you have two Wasm modules to cross, to cross between those, it's, it's still a little difficult. I think component model is aimed to solve that problem. Yeah. So. All right, so um, we're gonna hang around for a while. So, you know, uh, maybe outside of the room, you know, so, um, you know, if you have anything you want to discuss with us, you know, just feel, feel free. Otherwise, thank you so much. Yeah.